we've got our wonderful uh, friend from Humanity United, Michael, who's been a part of this community for, for a long time and supporting, uh, setting up an, a really neat panel that will actually touch on some of the issues that have started to surface in the previous panels and yesterday as well, on accessing information in hard to get areas. When you have non-permissive environments, regardless of why that environment is non-permissive, how do you access information? How do you analyze uh, that information? How do you get that information to actually serve as a feedback loop into whatever projects are being um, set up in these non-permissive environments. So thank you very much, Michael, for hosting, moderating, and it's over to you. Patrick, thank you very much, and a tremendous thanks to Jen and everyone else who's helped organize what has been a tremendous conference so far. My name is Michael Kleinman, and I'm a director of investments at Humanity United. We're a US-based foundation that focuses on the prevention of atrocities, as well as issues around human trafficking. And it's my absolute honor to introduce and moderate today's panel on the topic, which we'll get up there in a minute, of you can't get there from here, which is trying to answer the question of how do you capture and verify information from hard to access areas? Areas that are hard to access because of a lack of basic infrastructure, because of the demographics of the target population, for instance, high literacy rates, and or because a government insurgent group or others are actively trying to, to block access. And this touches on a question that was raised during the first panel around how do we get information from places like Somalia, rural Liberia, or even from severely disadvantaged communities in countries like India. In late 2012, Humanity United and USAID launched a joint tech challenge for atrocity prevention. And the goal of the, of the tech challenge was relatively simple. How can we identify new ideas, new ways of addressing discrete problems faced by human rights organizations, activists, and affected communities? The submissions were judged by a distinguished panel, including not only our own Patrick, but also people like Samantha Power and Ethan Zuckerman. On the panel today, we have three of the winners from the Tech Challenge, who are going to, again, look at that question of what are, two, what are new technological ideas, methods, and means to gather, to verify, and to analyze information from hard to access areas. To my left is Aditya Vashitha, who will speak on IVR Junction. Christoph Billen will speak on people's intelligence, and then Nathaniel Raymond, who will speak about amalgam. We're also excited and lucky to be joined today by Nat Walker from the Early Warning and Early Response Working Group in Liberia, which uses frontline SMS, use Shahidi, and other tools to gather information from across the country. And Nat offers a unique and incredibly valuable perspective on some of the challenges that come with integrating these technologies into existing and new infrastructures. Everyone will speak for 12 minutes and then we'll be followed by a Q&A. And we hope that the Q&A not only provides specific feedback for these ideas, but also sparks a, a broader discussion pulling on all of your experience and expertise about some of the lessons learned when it comes to integrating new technologies into the institutions on the ground, who at the end of the day are going to be responsible for early warning and early response. So thank you very much, and without further ado, Aditya. Thanks, Michael. My name is Aditya, and I am a PhD student at University of Washington. And today I'm going to talk about IVR Junction, which is a technology platform to enable robust multi-way communication in crisis scenarios. And I used to work at Microsoft Research India as a researcher uh, since, since September. And this is joint work with Bill Thies, who is a researcher at Microsoft Research India. And the first point I want to make is that voice remains primary interface 
for mobile subscribers in the developing world. And I would substantiate it with some facts from India. Uh, most of the subscribers in India lack smartphone. So only 5% people in India owns a smartphone. Remaining 95% people either use a basic phone or a feature phone. And 20% population in India uh, has internet con connection. That means majority of the population in a country like India still relies on phones for, uh, st still uses voice communication for phones. And of course, things are going to change eventually. Someday, there would be 100% internet penetration, 100% smartphone devices. But the argument which I'm trying to make is that even then, people are going to use phone as their primary devices of communication. They are going to use voice as their primary communication interface. And there are several reasons for this. Literacy, illiteracy is a huge problem. It has been there for over 50 years. It's not yet solved. I don't know how long it would take to solve. And again, quoting some figures from India, 33% people in India are illiterate. And 49% people who are literate are literate in languages other than English. And if you look at this circle pie chart on the right hand side, then they are literate in various different languages. There are certain languages like Kui, Kuruk, Gondi, who have millions of speakers and they have zero information, zero media sources at all. So these people, these are completely verbal communities with million speakers. So the question is, text interfaces are hindered by literacy and language barriers, but how can you reach out to those who are illiterate? And how can you reach out to those literate tribal population where mobile phone doesn't have any font support? So I designed technology uh, for people who are low literate, who, have, uh, who are in low socioeconomic status, and uses a dumb phone, uh, which just makes a voice call and reads an SMS, and have never interacted with the internet at all. And the opportunity of voice is not just some researchers have uh, recognized. Big corporations like Facebook provided a service in India where people can uh, upload an audio status message. And this slides needs no introduction to this community because Egypt revolution was driven by voice to tweets technology. And that is what I want to talk today about, interactive voice response systems. So what are interactive voice response systems? I bet almost all of you have at least once in your life have interacted with IVR systems. And IVR systems is typically when you call a customer call, call, call center and you, you hear a voice of a female or a male saying, welcome to this service, press one if you want to do this, press two if you want to talk to a customer care representative, and things like that. And interactive voice response systems have been there for almost like two decades. But only recently researchers and practitioners have used IVR systems to collect data and provide information to marginalized communities, low literate to people. And they have used it in a variety of ways, agriculture discussion forum, uh, disseminating health information, reaching out to urban sex workers, and citizen news journalism, entertainment platform, mapping platform, and things like that. So just to give you an example of an agriculture discussion forum, a farmer in a rural village calls a number, and what he hears is, in his local language, welcome to this forum, press one if you have any question, press two if you want to listen to the questions which are asked by others. When he presses one, records his question, the question goes to an expert, he can again call an IVR system, record the response to the question, and farmer gets what he needs. Another example could be atrocity, prevention, at atrocity reporting, or grievance reporting system where a person picks up his phone, dials, calls a number, and what he hears is press one if you have to report an atrocity, or if you have any grievance, and press two to learn about how the atrocities, I mean, how the grievances of others were resolved. So IVR Junction has had huge success in the area of information and communication technologies for development. Why? Because voice is a natural and accessible medium of communication. I can bet anything on it that every person who owns a phone knows how to call a person and how to answer a call. And that is all it takes to use an IVR system. But sure, there are tons of challenges. And I would like to highlight three major challenges which are there in the current IVR systems. The first challenge is the present day IVR systems are completely disconnected from the social media platforms which are used by people, privileged people like us. That means there is a lot of information and knowledge in the IVR systems, but it is completely disconnected from Facebook, YouTube, and social media, other social media platforms. The second problem is the current day IVR systems are extremely difficult to install, configure, and maintain. 
And I cannot stress that enough because the kind of <coughs> computer literacy you need is Linux. And I mean, I would let you answer that how many of you would be able to debug a code in Linux? And you guys interact with computers every day. So can a nonprofit and NGO do that? Absolutely not. And the third problem with IVR, uh, current day IVR systems is voice minutes are expensive. It's expensive than SMS. So there is a need to tackle all these three challenges, and that is why we do at IVR Junction. So the first point, IVR Junction connects people who are low literate, people who have low income, to the global social media. It increases their reach exponentially. So the present day IVR system, users can effectively reach to 1,000 people. But using a system like IVR Junction, they can reach to billion people who use a Facebook, hypothetically, of course. But the reach is increased exponentially. So every recording which you do after moderation goes on to a Facebook page and a YouTube channel. Of course, if you are an organization, you can decide to disconnect it from internet. But IVR Junction gives you this possibility that you can connect two different uh, knowledge communities into one whole. It's a device agnostic, platform agnostic, and network agnostic way of creating and accessing knowledge. And the reason why internet took off was because ordinary people like you and me were content, content producers in addition to being content consumers. And that is exactly what IVR Junction does. It enables low literate, low income people to generate content and share it with the global media, global social media. And the second advantage, say for example, you are a nonprofit or an NGO or a big organization who wants to connect to people in different geographical calling regions in different countries. You may want to create a system where people in different countries are calling an IVR system and reporting issues. The problem with that is in the state of the art IVR system, your server is going to be in one geographic location. So the numbers which they call are going to be in one geographic location. So if you have users in five different countries, then except one country, all four countries would be making an, users in all four countries would be making an international call. And which is unbelievable, I mean, it, it would be impossible to imagine that low income uh, and low socioeconomic status people and people who are, uh, you know, affected communities are going to do that. And that is why what IVR Junction does is, it's, it's, it's more or less like an internet. It's set up servers in different calling regions. People in a calling region call a local number. So for example, people in Kenya would call a Kenyan number. People in Uganda would call a, uh, a local number. But they would be accessing the same knowledge, the same data, the same audio messages which are recorded in all different locations. And this distributed architecture gives a lot of leverage, especially in case of crisis scenarios. It gives you affordability because the cost is, is reduced by a factor of six because you are making a local call to access and speak to people who are in different geographies. It, that means you can use it to coordinate efforts in multiple regions, multiple different calling regions. It, it gives you the power of scalability. Why? Because now if you want to extend your operations in a different calling region, what you need to do is just add one more circle. And that circle would synchronize with all the content which is there and in, in collected using IVR Junction so far. And most importantly, it gives you resilience. So say, for example, someone is determined to stop your services. They can take one node down, two nodes down. But in order to eradicate your data, they would have to take all these nodes down, which are there in different geographic locations. And not just that, there are several other important uh, advantages. And the one I would like to highlight is it's easy to install, configure, and maintain because it runs on a Windows platform, the most common operating system which is used by people especially by NGOs and nonprofits. And IVR Junction has Windows installer. It has APIs, so you can use, uh, use it as, as you would want to use it. And it's resilient to intermittent power and internet outages. IVR Junction is designed to work in uh, constrained environments. And it's, sorry, it's resilient to internet crackdown by network provider or, or, or internet provider. So what, what happens if the same thing happens, which happened in, wow, so many happens. Same thing happened in Arab Spring. So if government decides to shut down internet, so then also it is resilient. And the last thing is all hardware fit in a laptop. So all you need to do is have a laptop back. Your laptop is going to be there. Your hardware is going to be there. If you have to run somewhere, you can just pick your laptop, put all your stuff in a laptop bag and run, and then go to a different location and set it up again. So what it needs to set it up? All you need is a laptop, Windows operating system, IVR Junction software, which is 
free and open source, uh, available as Apache 2.0 license. And you need some web services account, like YouTube account, Facebook account, uh, SkyDrive account, Dropbox account. And of course, you, you would need to buy hardware, like GSM modems, and softwares like Voxio Prophecy, which runs IVR. So how has it been used? Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you remember 2012 Delhi gang rape case. It was a huge media sensation, at least in India. And uh, international press also reported it. So uh, women right activists in India have used IVR Junction to create a voice petition platform to get the opinions from people who don't go for demonstrations and who don't have internet. So you can go to www.facebook.com slash women and can find more information about it. Not just that, government of Somaliland used IVR Junction to facilitate a direct communication channel between government officials and rural tribal people. And the reason they did it is because they believe that there is a lot of misinformation and misinterpretation uh, because the existing media uh, channels like radio and newspapers and TVs have rural uh, and tribal affiliations, and, which is the and they distort facts and misinterpret the facts, and because of which there is instability. So they set up an IVR system where government officials can come, record a message, and can share it with, I mean, so, so, so let me say that again, government officials call a number, record a message, and rural tribal people can, can, can call the same number and listen to what government official has said, and can ask a follow-up question, and government official will get a notification that someone, someone has responded to his post, and then again he will uh, reply back. So it's more or less like a discussion forum, which is available not only on IVR, but also on YouTube uh, for a population in diaspora, like a lot of Somaliland people lives in uh, London. So another way to think about this is a Facebook post, government official says something on Facebook and then people start commenting on it and then again he responds to them. And if you go to the official website of Somaliland Parliament, then and go to the, I cannot read that, go to about the Parliament section and public feedback, then you'll see some of the recordings which were collected, some of the conversations which happened between government officials and uh, rural tribal people using the software. And Voice of America, is using IVR Junction to uh, get news uh, to and from Mali, uh, getting feedback on the news. So if you want to know more about this project, then please feel free to talk to me uh, later. And I would end by giving you uh, four lessons which we learned very hard way. And I'm going to use a quote by Kentaro uh, Toyoma. Uh, and what he says is, technology amplifies human intent and capacity. It doesn't substitute for them. And I cannot agree more with that. If you are an organization, and I'm sure that all of you agree to this, you get an organization use of technology is going to be successful <coughs> only if the processes used by the organization are strong. The humans who are driving the organizations are strong. Mm -hmm. Technology is not a magical potion where you use, just use it and something magic is going to happen. And a lot of time, I had to dissuade people to use technology. More than convincing them, I have to dissuade them because it's, I mean, some people have techno-utopian view, and technology doesn't work that way. You would need people to drive that technology. So use technology only when it is necessary. And the second lesson, end users must trust the technology and your system, and less technology and more your system. So if your end user trusts the organization who is providing the technology, then only they are going to use the technology, not because it's an insanely awesome technology. So you must work with trusted grassroots organization to have an impact. The third lesson, there is this uh, big data, sure, awesome. More data is not always good. Bad data, is, bad data hurts a lot. And you, you, as crisis mappers, you have seen that happen all the time when you see a lot of misinformation and rumors on the Twitter. So facts, verif facts verification is, uh, is critical, especially in crisis mapping. And the last thought is, please don't underestimate or overestimate end users who are going to use the technology. And the reason of overestimation is that a lot of people would think, oh, it's an IVR system. You just have to make a call and to access the stuff. Oh, it's just an SMS. You can do that. But a lot of people cannot do that. They struggle while while interacting with these basic stuff. And at the same time, don't, don't underestimate them as well. Because the same people who were struggling with IVR and SMS at one point of time 
were able to perform complex tasks. And because why? They were inherently motivated to do it. And secondly, because they learned from intermediate use. So uh, because I'm a researcher, there is, uh, if you want to know about the data which is be behind all these lessons learned, then please feel free to talk to me offline. And so far, we are just growing. We, it's, it's a project which is run by two people and a lot of friends. So uh, we, are, we are slowly growing. So over 20,000 voices have been heard globally. A lot of people are using it. If you want to use it, please chat with me. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Aditya. Um, my name is Christoph Billen. I'm actually a political analyst and crime analyst for about the last 10 years. I've been working in and out of conflict areas, uh, both for the UN and more recently for the International Criminal Court. Um, I'm typically an end user of the data which is produced by many of the organizations around here. And I'd like to start from one of the lessons learned uh, from Adicia, which is sometimes, while well, more data uh, might become problematic, sometimes the data just doesn't have the quality that we would like it to have. So I kind of came up with an idea about a few years ago, and it's been in the <clears throat> been developing for a few years, and the Tech Challenge allowed me and gave me the opportunity to present it, which gave me also the opportunity to come here. So I'd like to go first to a, first of a few of the problems that I see with crowdsourcing initiative of human rights violations. I've been researching for the past two months a lot of crowdsourcing initiatives around the world, uh, a lot of volunteers who have been putting a lot of time, a lot of efforts in trying to monitor human rights violations um, using crowdsourcing techniques. But often, me as an analyst and the end user, uh, I find it very difficult to use their data. And I'll explain a few reasons. First, the quality of the information is not always very good. Often there is no standard taxonomy which is being used, so every project comes up with its own categories, which sometimes it's the person who is inputting the information in their system which is tagging it, sometimes it's the person, the source himself, who is tagging it. There's rarely any definitions that comes with any of those categories, which also makes it difficult for the source to understand what those categories might stand for. Oh, sure, sorry. Um, Another problem is that there is often or rarely any source evaluation, meaning it's very difficult to know what is the reliability of your source, which is providing information to you, and also very difficult to assess the credibility of the information. Now, personally, I don't really believe in verified and non-verified information. I don't believe in gray and, and black and white, but more in gray. Additional information might provide you with a completely different view on previously received information. So I think that's something important to try to address. Another issue, of course, is that if the data doesn't have the quality you need, it's very difficult also to deduplicate the data. So you might have records of information that are about the same incident, but it might be difficult basically to find those duplicates. It also hampers verification and further the analysis. Now, Another of the problems often with the crowdsourcing initiatives of human rights violations is that it's mostly a monologue. So people are reporting violations, it's being stored on the platform, it's being mapped some, at times, but there is rarely any feedback loops to the source. I think that's also something that we need to think about and see how we can try to address this in the future. Of course, and we've been talking about this today, earlier, there is a major issue of data security and user safety that needs to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. And again, many of the initiatives and projects I've researched seem to pay sometimes little attention to those very important issues. At times, they go at length trying to inform the user base about what kind of security precautions they should take when communicating such kind of sensitive information. But at times, there is none of that information available on the website, and when talking to them, well, because I've interviewed a few of them as well, uh, they seem not to realize always that this might be an issue. Now, 
maybe a few solutions on how to address these issues, and this is what people's intelligence is, will try to achieve in, in the nearby future. First, I'd like to propose a paradigm shift, which some of you have already raised <clears throat> over the last few days, which is to go from a monologue to a dialogue. So, enforcing feedback loops. You receive information, let's get back to your source and provide them with information that is practical for, uh, for them and upon which they can take action without always having to wait for a third party organization to come to their assistance. Also, I think it's important, as has been raised here, um, to remain low tech, as low tech as possible. So people's intelligence has originally been designed with SMS as its main technology, but I'm recently looking into USSD because it also has a lot of different advantages, which is you can establish a synchronous session which is also much cheaper, if not free. And uh, you can basically start asking questions to your user base. Now, what I think is highly important is that maybe it's also a shift from the typical categories that people can tag, which as I said, might differ from one organization to another, to actually start asking holistic questions. Typical, the five W's and one H question. When and where, what, why, and how? I forgot one. <laughs> um, and of course, how do you know? I think that's very important, at least as an analyst that is looking at information uh, coming from users, it's very important to know, I mean, what is the immediacy to the facts of that user, of that source? Is that person very close to the fact? Has he directly witnessed? the crime or the allegation of crimes that he's reporting about, or he just heard about it from somebody else. This has a huge impact also you know, on the credibility of the information that we're gonna analyze later. I'd like, so besides asking users, sources, to respond to all those questions, so when did the incident happen, where did the incident happen, who committed that incident, how did they do that, and what did they do exactly? I think it's also important then to start using, I mean, some of the technology which exists now and which you people have been working on, which is semantic analysis, among others, which would allow you basically then once you get that information into your system, to start clustering that information with thematic and issues so that you can assess, hopefully, automatically, the relevance of that information that comes in. You can also combine it with machine learning, which over time would allow basically your system to become better at it. And microtasking, but I'll come to microtasking a little later. Now, what I'd like to do with you is just to run you through basically an example of what such a system might do and why it might be useful. Oh, sure, a last point, which is also important, ethics. Now, monitoring human rights violations um, if we take into consideration the issue of data security and user safety, maybe we should also reflect and we should also be make the very important decision sometimes not to deploy our systems because we cannot ensure that our actions will not have negative consequences for or the people we're actually trying to help. So that's something I believe we all should reflect upon before actually we make the decisions about acquiring data. Now, I made a a little comic strip, if you like, just to explain what a system like people's intelligence hopefully could do in the future. So typically you have a person who is witnessing, in this case, a killing or a massacre, and reports it via SMS or USSD session. I witnessed the massacre. Now, this is information that me as an analyst, I cannot do much with it. So the idea here is that an information system would look for the relevance of that information. Now, it's not information about a pizza recipe, for example, so that's not relevant, but it's about a massacre, so that's relevant, so let's act upon it. But obviously, a lot of information is missing. We don't know when and where that incident happened, we don't know who perpetrated that incident, what type of, we do know the type of crime, we don't know the number of victims, for example, and we don't know how that source knows about it. So what I propose here is to engage into a dialogue with that source. Now often, those people go at great length to actually send that information in the first place. So why not get back to them and ask them more questions? Basically, typically, well, where did it take place? 
and when did it take place, and who did it, and so forth, until you get all the quality information that you need to perform your analysis. Now, that also allows you, in exchange, to provide such people with practical information they might act upon. So if you know when and where an incident happened, and what type of incident it is, and how many victims there are, well, you might provide these people with information as to where they can seek help or assistance. At the same time, you might also provide some early warnings to NGOs and rescue services in the area that such an incident might have happened. With the consent of the source, you might even put them in touch. Now that's the first part of the idea, how to get relevant information. The first part of the idea is how to verify information, which I think is something that has been bugging a lot of us for quite some time now. So I'll take the same example. You did receive that structured data, which is therefore easy to parse within the database, and you can start looking for corroborated uh, records of information, and you don't find any. So there's no other records of a similar incident that might have happened in that area, so it's very difficult for you to corroborate if that incident happened in the first place and also to trust that person who reported to you. You don't know that person. All you might have is just a telephone number and that information. So therefore, as an analyst, if I look at it, I would typically perform what we call source evaluation, which is I would attribute a reliability score for that source, which would be unknown at this stage, and a credibility score for the information, which is, again, unknown. I don't know if this is true. What could be done but again, here I want to pause first. It depends very much on the security situation on the ground and on the consequences of our actions, which might be detrimental to the people who are actually trying to help. We need to choose very carefully how we try to verify that information. So there are different scenarios, of course. If you're in a conflict area with a malevolent regime who has the capacity to interfere with your communications, maybe you only want to ask people you trust, NGOs maybe in the area, to try and verify that incident. So you could send them a message, typically saying, hey, an incident happened here at, uh, on that particular date. Could you verify it, first of all, if an incident happened, and document it? So then you could get, basically, independent information from independent sources. Now, if such information comes back to you and corroborates what your first source says, well, it will have a positive impact on that source's reliability, and also, it might provide you even additional information that you might not know about. So you might also confirm that yes, it did happen in that village, that it did happen on that date, that there were two people killed. But maybe it also might allow you to know that actually there might be more than two or three people killed. So also based on that, what you can do is then automatically try to attribute reliability scores to your sources and credibility scores to your information. Now I have a few more slides, but I will try to go fast. Yeah, so um, user safety and data security. I think that's a very important point which I have addressed. And maybe some of you can answer me later, tomorrow I have a self-organized session. Would USSD protocol be a good protocol to work with, which might be more secure than SMS, for example? Low literacy rate and vernacular language. I think Aditya has spoken at length about it, and I think there is also ways of combining these kind of processes with IVR systems, for example. And maybe also microtasking, because there's a big problem here is that all the recorded voice need to be post-processed, uh, post meaning you need to transcribe it, transform it into text so that it actually can be analyzed. So maybe here microtasking might be a good tool. I mean, it might, might be helping. Sensitization of a user base, of course, is key. I mean, there's no way that, I mean, you're just gonna launch a platform and people will know about it. And buying from NGOs and international organizations in the area as well, I mean, again, as Aditya has mentioned, very important. Funding. So the next steps, um, I have a self-organized session tomorrow at 15.30 in room seven, so please come along. I'd like to discuss this idea even further with you and see what, what problems you might see, uh, also how you might help. Um, I'm currently doing this market research, which is funded by, the, <clears throat> by uh, Open Society Justice Initiative. That's my first next step. And then I want to do a requirement analysis and a feasibility study before doing a first prototype and then a pilot in situation. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. How are you all doing? So before I talk about what I came here to talk about, I'm going to talk about what I didn't come here to talk about, which is, as some of you may know, as director of the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, similar to my colleagues up here, I've been doing a lot of thinking with my team and uh, folks at HHI about issues of ethical standards for this field. I've been doing a lot of thinking uh, with the team about the right to information during disaster. Now, I'm not going to get into those today, except to say one thing before we talk about a lot of technical stuff, which is we often think that our first principle here is to build Tomorrowland, the world of the future. I don't think that. I think our job is to try hard as hell not to build Jurassic Park. So we talk a lot about do no harm. That is not enough guidance to develop the technical tools with a moral and legal and ethical intelligence that allows them to properly function in the field. So I'm going to talk about some technical tools, but I don't want us to divorce the methodological development from our professionalization and our pedagogical and theoretical development as a field. They cannot be separated. And one last thing, think about doctors. Doctors, when they develop a new medicine or a new technical device, like a syringe, or a stethoscope even. That is developed the way it is because they have the Hippocratic Oath, they have the Nuremberg Code, the common rule on, in the United States on human subjects research. The technical device reflects the moral and ethical and legal architecture within which they operate in reference to the beneficiary, within which they define their relationship to the patient and thus the rights and dignity of the patient. So let's not lose that and uh, let's get technical. So the signal program grew out of the Satellite Sentinel Project's pilot phase. For 18 months, my colleagues, students, faculty, staff, interns, volunteers, uh, we were not crisis mappers alone, we were geographers of atrocity. We were cartographers of human security. And what we were doing is we were trying to use high resolution satellites and the fusion of open source reports from the field to basically, yes, document threats to human security in real time, but we were doing something subtle and something equally important or trying to which is we were trying to develop forensic standards for treating the data we handle as evidence. In many cases, we are like CSI. We are the frontline crime scene investigators in non-permissive environments. Everything we're handling is evidence, potentially. And instead of shell casings, we have ones and zeros. Instead of a blood spatter on the floor, we have text messages we have an image. The fact is we have no forensic standard or theory or chain of custody for the preservation of this evidence. And I have to be blunt. The platforms we are using in terms of Twitter and Ushahidi, while highly responsive for getting information from the crowd in a kinetic environment, shred your chain of custody and your preservation of evidence. They are platforms that are very good at making your digital evidence of an alleged war crime absolutely inadmissible in court. And that's really, really bad. So what we're trying to do is to fix that. Because until we fix that, we're not only not getting the right evidence and putting it in the right digital plastic bag to take it to the right DNA lab, we may in fact be contaminating 
the crime scene. And I think we are. And we gotta, we gotta own it. Because we can't change it till we go to our support group and say, yeah, we got a problem. So how do we solve it? Well, what we're trying to do is not focus on big data. It's to go back to our, our colleague Emmanuel, as he said earlier, small data. It's about intentional <laughs> collection of small data with an organizing intelligence in theory behind it. The big data matters little if your small data is fundamentally flawed. And that's just on an individual data stream. We don't work with individual data streams, especially with satellites. We are working with fused view situational awareness or the attempt to have it. And when we are adding streams together, we can be contaminating the environment. So, amalgam is just one of the methods we're trying to develop. And what it is, why it's called amalgam, is we're trying to see how you take feature extraction, so algorithms for taking shapes and identifying them in satellite imagery, and not replacing manual approaches, but combining them together in one specific use case, which is temporary structures to begin with. So what we're trying to build is a toggable format where you can say, I am looking for standard UNHCR refugee tents. And we have set agreed parameters for what that observable object looks like. And you put it in and you get your algorithmic feedback from Amalgam, and then you manually check it. And you put both the manual and algorithmic result and send that to a cloud of other people you are working with. Why? Because we can't develop evidence standards until we have examples of evidence to share. At FBI, when they are training forensic specialists, they look at thousands of carpet samples before <laughs> they collect any evidence. We have not gathered together our potential examples of forensic evidence found in remote digital data. Amalgam around one repeating use case, which is the temporary structure, which can show displacement, can show direct threat to human security, flight from a camp, can in some cases show the destruction of a village or the destruction of a temporary settlement. This is the beginning of an effort to build these forensic standards not only for potential international justice mechanisms, but also for humanitarian response. Because when we are using this as a basis for programmatic decision, we have to be precise, and we have to know that we're precise and know why we got there. So two last things. My colleagues, Brittany Carr and Isaac Baker, um, are working together based on the method we used to identify alleged mass graves in Sudan in 2011 with the Satellite Sentinel Project to formalize the methodology we use there, which is called GRID, ground reporting through imagery delivery, which is about involving, similar to what Christoph was saying, involving the eyewitness in the process of independent double-blind verification by sharing previous satellite imagery with them. And this is important. I ran into some folks here um, from Sudan, and I went up to them, uh, one of them yesterday, and I said, it's good to meet you because I finally got to meet my boss, because you're the one I work for. So the point is this. We have been trying to fit technology to people. We now have to start fitting technology to the operational challenges of the environments where people could live or die, and sometimes do, depending on our interventions. So the challenge of now, back to what I said, is to do the hard work of having the theory behind the small data to collect it in a way that is ethical, <laughs> that is moral, and that integrates together whether you are seeking justice or seeking to deliver assistance. And we're up, we're up to this, <laughs> but we have to embrace it. And if we do, it will be transformative. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
Um, my name is Nat Walker, and I'm from Liberia. And like Michael said, I coordinate the conflict early warning and early response working group, um, which is coordinated by the Liberia Peace Building Office. The Liberia Peace Building Office is the United Nations Peace Building Fund Secretariat in Liberia, and they have a number of programs relating to um, peace building, reconciliation, development um, <coughs> in Liberia. Um, but with support from Humanity United, my work focuses on um, developing a network of civil society organizations, government actors, um, and UN organizations to work for the containment of potential threat that could lead to um, violence. So um, for this presentation, we're going to focus on collaboration, how the groups in Liberia collaborate on issues around conflict warning, conflict early warning and early response. Our work go beyond just um, collecting of data. We want to be able to ensure that something happened with the data that we collect over time and also as the uh, incidents occur. And so I will give you an overview of how we work. As you know, as many of you may know, Liberia, um, violent conflict started in Liberia in December of 1989, and it completely destroyed the country. Um, it was after several years of negotiation that peace finally came to Liberia. And for now, the country is, um, for the most part, um, being protected by the UN through the United Nations missions in Liberia. And there are complex challenges that we face as a nation now. Um, but most importantly is that our mill is about to draw down. As a matter of fact, they are already drawing down from Liberia. Um, from the troop size of 15 to 17,000, they have dropped down to a little over 5,000. So then what happens um, after Omil finally leaves? That's the challenge that we are facing as um, Liberians. And that's why a conflict early warning, early response system is very, very necessary for Liberia. So there are a number of um, organizations that are involved in um, the conflict early warning and early response network. Um, we have um, uh, civil society organizations, UN organizations, and government actors that are involved in the work of the conflict early warning working group um, with support of Humanity United, as I said, along with other partners, including support from the UN Peace Building Fund, um, we move this work forward. And then we also have a large network of um, community-based peace workers. We call them the, the um, county peace committees. They are spread all over the country. Um, they are involved in the actual data collection that feeds into our system, our early warning um, platform, internet-based platform, which is um, called the Learn Platform. You can find it at the web address there. That's www.learn at ushahili.com. So we introduced the Ushahili system um, using frontline SMS, and that's what we use to map our data. OK, so um, how does the group work? Um, we work in a number of ways, but primarily, we started off by dividing up into clusters. So we have four clusters, the warning cluster, the response cluster, the technology cluster, and the research clusters. So some of those organizations are in more than one cluster. But basically, the organizations that are involved in warning are the ones that um, have reporters around the field collecting data, and they make their periodic report in addition to joint reports that the network as a whole, the Conflict Early Warning Working Group, prepares. We have organizations within the network that primarily are responsible to engage in response activities, be it resp rapid response or um, long-term response activities which will involve um, holding of continuous dialogue, reconciliation forums, and so on. And then we have the technology cluster. Um, we have an organization there, iLab, which is um, patterned after the iHub, um, 
okay, um, from the inception we had um, Yushahidi, but that uh, Yushahidi had been transformed into the iLab, and the iLab incorporated most of the staff of Yushahidi. So they coordinate the technology aspect of the working group. And then we have the research component. Okay, our analysis that we do over a period of time trend analysis and research reports that are informed by longitudinal data, data. So we have um, organizations that are part of the working group that um, conduct those special surveys and periodic research from time to time and the information that they generate feeds into what we um, um, report. So um, we approach early warning, early response in Liberia, like I said, from three mindset. The first has to do with um, collaboration, collaboration in terms of um, the early warning, early response working group. Like I said, where we had UN organizations, we, had, um, we have um, government agencies, and um, civil society organizations. The reason why we incorporated the government agencies, or at least invited them to form part of the network, is the fact that um, to engage in rapid response say trying to deal with riot or something that threatens immediate peace within the community, we need the support of the government, the police, and so on. So we have um, representatives from the National Police, from the Drug Enforcement Agency, the National Security Agency, the Ministry of Defense, they all form part of the working group. Okay. Um, so, and then the group focus on sharing of information. Okay. Each of those organizations operate individually, doing their own early warning, early response work, but then the information is shared with the bigger group. And then together we are able to formulate joint recommendations and come up with um, actions that we can collectively um, approach. The second way we, we um, deal with early warning, early response, second approach, strategic approach is to um, deal with it from the establishment of uh, community-based early warning systems involving county peace committees. So currently we have um, county peace committees in, we, Liberia has a total of 155 districts and we have county peace committees, um, early warning systems established in about 62 districts. So um, those peace committees have early warning focal persons. Those focal persons report to the early warning working group through the learning platform using frontline SMS. And then recently what we are trying to do now in terms of strategic approach is to link the work of the counter early warning working group, the counter peace committees, um, the national early warning working group and all of the other actors to the regional justice and security hub. So under the UN peace building fund, um, the security sector reform, they have established, they are going to establish five regional justice and security hubs which will serve as a one-stop clearinghouse for all security and justice issues. So currently they have, they are construct, they have constructed one and they have, they are constructing two additional. So in 2014, our target is to link um, the work that we are doing with those regional security hubs so that we have rapid response centers at each of those um, three regional hubs. So if there is something that is about to happen, a threat to peace, so in terms of incident or report that requires immediate response from the security sector, the, that information will filter immediately to what they call the command and control center that they have at the regional hub. Okay, so um, in summary, we'll say, um, what are we trying to achieve within the next, uh, Within a space of one to two, one to three years, which we consider as our short term, we try to focus on um, two key outputs, um, speaking programmatically. Um, one is the establishment of the early warning, early response working group, which we talk about, comprising of the network of um, civil society organizations, the UN organization, and government actors. Okay. The second thing we try to do is to strengthen to establish and strengthen county peace committees so that they will be able to, um, one, report on early warning in issues in terms, of, uh, incident in terms of regular incident reports, and then to also have them trained to engage in first stage early warning response, early response activities such as um, 
mediation, community dialogue, and other types of conflict transformation activities. Um, and then in terms of outcome, we focus that um, three key outcomes. One is that the peace building office, like I said, coordinate all peace building activities in Liberia. So we want to make sure that the peace building office has the capacity to collect information that comes from around the field regarding incidents that threaten peace and security. The second thing we want to do is to ensure that the information that we gather reach to the relevant policy makers and respond actors so that the peace that we have in Liberia today will not turn violent. Liberia is in a very fragile state, as I said, and the situation is as such that um, the least mistake that one make, um, everything can just blow up. There's an incident, a situation, someone was speaking earlier about Roma and how Roma can, um, can cause uh, so much of violence. There was a place in Liberia called Lofa County, and there's always Muslim Christian tension in the country. So someone picked up a cell phone and called one person in Morovia and said, oh, do you, did you hear the news? They just burned a church in this town. And just by that information reaching one person in Morovia, that person in Morovia called another person, and that person called another person. And the next thing we realized was that they were burning all of the mosques and the church, uh, sorry, all of the mosques Muslim schools and everything that belonged to the Muslim because it was said that the church was burned by a, by a Muslim person. So that was something that was not even true, but just because um, one person just picked up a phone and said that happened in Lofa. It happened in Lofa, which is miles upon miles away from Morovia, and Christians in Morovia heard it destroy everything that belonged to the Muslims in Morovia. So with that kind of situation, we need to have in place a system where there can be um, rapid response because probably the violence could have been taken care of from the very initial stage, but in no term it escalated. Okay, um, so um, running forward, so in terms of impact, what we want to make is at the end of the day, we want to ensure that major potential conflict in Liberia will not um, reach a point where um, that it will be dealt with, sorry, um, to the point where it won't escalate into widespread violence. So, um, okay, so our short-term initiative activities, like I was saying, is that um, we focus on the early warning working group and um, the county peace committees establishment around the country. And then we have the work of the early warning working group strategically linked to that of the county peace committees. So that reports from around the feed Feel goes to the early warning working group through this learn system, the Yushahidi Learn platform, and then um, the early warning working group at the national level conducts joint analysis and come up with um, recommendations for policymakers. So, and we have come up with some new initiatives which I want to run through quickly. New initiatives include um, um, trying to expand our capacity to map with. We are not covering the entire country right now, but rather uh, counties that we consider as conflict-prone counties. So we want to ensure that we can cover all 15 counties, which would then be one, all 155 districts. The second thing we're trying to do is to set up a community-based rapid response pool fund, where communities, uh, members, and its county peace committees can access in order to engage in first stage response activities among themselves. And then the setting up of the, the rapid response center at the regional centers. And we're also establishing uh, early warning, early response um, small grant. In fact, it's already established and we've given out some money to civil society organizations in order for them to engage in um, response activities. So um, the working group quickly engage in terms of course of action. What, what, how do we work? You know, so we receive information. When we receive information, we watch, the informa watch. In terms of watching, we try to assemble additional information relating to that after collating all of the data. Um, we focus on inquiring, additional inquiries, um, 
set up task force to go out and find out what it is. We have a verification tree where we call the communities, people in the community to find out did this thing really occur? How did it happen? And then we do analysis as well as um, focusing on referral. Refer a lot um, to either state security um, or we refer to county peace committees if a particular uh, issue needs to be resolved at the community level. And then, of course, we close up the issues. And this is a snapshot of the Yushahidi um, learning platform that we have. If you go on the web, address that I gave you, you'll be able to see it. Okay, but I just want to just quickly run through some lessons that we learned relating to mapping. We do, every now and then we conduct um, lessons learning, lesson learning workshop where we compile them, but I pick up this from the list. So one is that you may think that SMS messaging is very, very simple, but for people in those hard to reach communities, in Liberia, it's very, very difficult for them to do. When we had our first training, we, we had one hour for text messaging, and we had uh, um, more time allotted for incident identification. It was surprising to know that we spent almost half a day on just trying to teach some of those people in those hard to reach communities how to text message. So that's one thing that we look for as we conduct the trainings. Um, feedback. Okay, the reporters in the field need feedback. We started off and every time we go back in the field, they will ask us, what's happening to the information that you gather? What is it, all of the incident reports that we're sending, what are you doing with it? So they need feedback, it serves as a motivation. And so when we prepare a policy report, even though it may be 25, 30 pages, we do a PowerPoint presentation in large bold prints and when we call them together, we share with them, these are what this is so, these are summaries of what you reported, and these are the recommendations, and this is where it is. This is at the Ministry of Defense, this is at the police, and this is at the other place. Okay, the next thing is that um, to map, you know, we heard a lot about mapping to, um, during this workshop, and I saw some very fascinating map, okay, maps. And, but the reason why we are laying heavy emphasis on response activities is that mapping is not enough. Okay, you can do all of the mapping, all of the data collection, but then what? Okay, and that is why we are taking response activities very, very seriously in the work in which we do. Okay, um, and then the next, the last thing is that um, there are organizations that, when we started off the network, organizations ran early warning, early response program very, very separately, independently, individually. We had to bring the network together. And what we learned is that um, we definitely achieve more if we operate as one um, united uh, front in trying to engage policymakers and trying to response, uh, uh, engage response actors. And that is why we have one single platform for all of the early warning organizations in Liberia, the Learn platform there where we try to consolidate all of the early warning information to make sure that uh, we can make collective impact. Thank you very much. I'm going to absolutely abuse my powers as a moderator here and be an asshole for a second. It is the end of a long day, and could everyone just stand up? Shake something. I don't care what it is. I promise to avert my eyes. All right, abuse of power is over. We, um, again, thank you guys so much for, for listening and thank you to a really terrific panel. We will take questions one by one. We're gonna start from the audience, then go back to anything that's coming over, over social media. Do we have any questions? Hi, I just wanted to thank the panel. Um, I had uh, two questions for Christoph and one for Nathaniel. I wanted to ask uh, Christoph, what is it about uh, a message semantics that specifically for human rights violations could be identified to make that message trusted? Another question I had was, what is it about crowdsourcing specifically that lends itself so well to crowdsourcing human rights violations cases? I don't see it, that, or I, I just don't know what it is. 
Uh, I'm sorry, can you just repeat a second question? Um, what is it about crowdsourcing as a method that lends itself well to um, identifying and pursuing human rights violations? My, my question to Nathaniel was, um, what are the challenges? Do you mind holding that and having Chris Dobson first? Absolutely, yeah, sure. OK. Thank, thank you for your questions. Um, I don't think that the semantics themselves can make your message trusted. Um, what I believe is possible, though, is that if that you collect quality information and answers to basic questions, when, where, who did what, and how many victims there were, and how do you know, you get enough quality information that you can then, and if it's basically uh, structured information, you can easily pass it into a database, and then you can basically look for, you can run the duplication algorithms and look for other records in your database which share similar characteristics. And then, of course, it will still be, I believe, a human being will have to make the decision if yes or no, I mean, those records are related to one another. So I don't think that semantics alone answer that question. What the semantics allows you to do, I believe, is that first of all, I mean, to, de to, to decide if the message that you receive is relevant or not. So let's say you receive a message about a pizza recipe and you're looking for human rights violations in information, obviously, it's not relevant. So that's easy. Now, what it allows you to do as well is that, I mean, um, it also allows you basically to um, assess, for example, you receive a message, people are free to text in the way they want. But I mean, let's say people will refer to a killing as a murder, a death, I don't know. But this you can then semantically cluster with other terms which are similar, and therefore from that you can also again assess relevance. Is that answering the question? Okay, so second question, crowdsourcing method, while, why would it be fit to human rights uh, uh, monitoring. Okay, now the, the typical way people go about human rights monitoring and, and, uh, and, and research it, I mean, and I don't want to, I think it can basically, is that, okay, so typical human rights organizations, they have limited resources and time. So um, they go in, in the field, to research some big human rights violations they've maybe heard about, I mean, they are their own sources on the ground, or local NGOs which are working with them, or the media desks. But they can't basically be permanently present everywhere in a country and report about every single violation. So um, I think it would be really helpful to them as well if the people had the ability to report whatever happens to them whenever they believe it's important for them to report. So they should take the onus to some extent, I mean, in reporting these. And their crowdsourcing can be really helpful, I believe. But I believe also it's very important to help them to report it in a valuable way so that organizations like existing organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, or other organizations like the ICC or other courts can then later use that information and make also decisions basically where to distribute, where to and better use their resources. And for example, uh, uh, what incidents should be investigated and not, for example. Uh, I just wanted to ask Nathaniel, um, what are the main challenges that we're facing to, say, professionalize crisis mappers? That's a good question. And I, I want to really put an asterisk next to professionalize. I think there is, this is a community that started as volunteers. Um, and this is absolutely no slight against volunteers. It's actually a credit to how far you've brought this field. Um, so let's, when we say the word professionalize, we are talking about standardize, routinize, and prepare, equip. Um, now, one, one of the major challenges is that we have a lack of theory about just taking some of Christoph's work, what has probative value as evidence. And what that means in English is, what are pieces of digital data that, rel that are consistent with an alleged crime type? So in the case of a physical crime scene, if we're dealing with a, a human corpse, um, we look at things like lividity, whether the body's been moved, um, evidence of physical trauma, when we're using satellites and we're using open source reporting, we don't have a similar theory because we haven't really looked at it this way. And we also thus don't have tools that reflect those best practices. 
And that's no one's fault, but it's everybody's responsibility. I think the second challenge is this, which is, what is it we're doing? We say the word humanitarian a lot. And as someone who has been, uh, was with Oxfam in the past, the word humanitarian, when you use it, it is not um, an adjective. It is a commitment to a type of relationship with the beneficiary and a commitment to law of Geneva. And so the question is, what does humanitarian information provision look like? What does human rights forensic information collection look like? They will look different, but we need to be very careful what we call things and call things by the right name and then develop from that. Hello, Christoph. Hi. Um, right here on this side. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I, you know, it seems that the technology, uh, I mean, it, it, it's workable. I don't, I don't see any problem. I mean, obviously, there are always challenges, but I, I don't see too much of a problem in technology now. It seems that you might have a challenge on on adoption, on you know, mass adoption. So, for example, what I at some point it resembles. You're simply trying to adopt and correct me if I'm wrong, but it resembles like a 911 type of service. Right, so it's kind of an adoption service, which, if it resembles a 911 type of service, it's kind of a very basic service, you know, a reporting service. So uh, my question is, how can you, uh, how are you planning around adoption? Like, uh, what's your strategy to make people adopt it and actually use it? And, and, and so right. I mean, um, okay, I'm still in the very early phases of the development of this project, so that's the first thing I want to say. Um, the second thing is, of course, like I mentioned, I mean, I need a buy-in of, you know, I mean, existing organizations, I mean, international organizations, NGOs on the field and so forth, who would be capital, I mean, to also uh, sensitize their your own user base. Then besides that, of course, I mean, you can use, you can run uh, typical sensitization campaigns, you know, over radio, uh, leaflet distributions, uh, talking to community leaders and so forth, and having training sessions. Now, what is also possible is to use SMS campaigns, basically, to, to alert people People, I mean that this service is available to them and that those are the instructions how to use it. Um, another way possibly is to partner with telecommunication providers and uh, also have them advertise you know, about this service maybe at the back of their airtime tickets to suggest ideas of how this might happen. But of course it necessitates a lot of sensitization, potential training as well. Uh, I do realize uh, that there are also issues in terms of um, not everybody is, is illiterate and, and therefore can text messages. So you should have backup options such as use of IVRs and call centers that should be able to receive people's call and then do the transcription of the information and upon that provide the necessary answers to their questions and support. My question is for, for Nat. Um, Kate Cummings has spoken here before. Um, David Foster is part of this community as well. And I think that uh, iLab really represents something that we kind of think of as a model of what does a lab do and how does that build community. So my question is, um, I know that Afro Labs exists and there's exchange programs of some kind, but do you think that the lessons that you've learned um, could be applied in other places, one, and two, um, the things that you mentioned about digital literacy gaps and how to train, um, as somebody who does do training, what are, there, whether, are there any resources and tips that you can give for people like us who want to help bring technology but just really, really know that there's gaps? Well, yeah, I know for sure that the lessons um, that we've learned for our work, not only this, but for other lessons can be um, applied in other areas, especially um, if you look at um, countries around Africa, West Africa as a whole, because it's the same, uh, similar context. Um, but in terms of how support can flow, definitely there's a lot of work that we still need to do, especially when it comes to the area of how, well, how we map. Um, I was speaking to someone earlier and I said, um, I know that we are laying a lot of emphasis on how we respond to um, the incidents that we report, trying to set up a very good structure, which is the emphasis of our work. Um, but we can still benefit from a lot more help when it comes to how we um, map our data, you know, so that um, people out there will be able to see it. And in terms of utilization, 
I think we are pretty much solid in terms of what we want to do. Okay, but it's just a matter of um, using introduction of new technology or looking at the Yushahidi and see how we can improve it. And I must say that when we first started to use Yushahidi, it wasn't what we are using now is not as we got it. Okay, because initially it was made for um, crowdsourcing, but we've done a lot of work on it trying to modify it and modify it so that it will be able to uh, meet our specific needs. And so, um, yeah, any additional help in that direction could also do. And that's why we've been talking to a number of persons here about the work we do. Yeah. All the way in the back. My question is going to go to Raymond uh, from Harvard Initiative. Raymond, thank you for an amazing presentation, first of all. Um, but I'm, I'm a bit surprised with the direction your presentation was going, and I wanted to find, are you proposing that um, the research that needs to be done by people out there will get the, the evidence that they need on the ground, and then how, how do you marry that? I, I just, I don't see how you can um, try to get evidence on the ground digitally and then link it to some crime scene. I just don't see the two integrating, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how would you digitally collect evidence on the ground and then relate it to find evidence about a crime scene? I'm, I'm, I'm just... Um, that is a great question. Um, thank you for your kind words and thank you for your very direct uh, query. Um, let's get to it. Two things. Um, and let's use real world examples from our work at the Signal Program. One is that reports we did for the Satellite Sentinel Project, which are a combination of collecting every single piece of open source material we can get in Arabic, in English, multiple languages, and then breaking it down into its DNA to detect patterning that we try to cross-corroborate with the satellite sensor. So what that means is Brittany, who is our data analysis coordinator and her team, what they do is they take every report and they decode it into time of report, <laughs> time of reported event, separating out the report and the reported. And then they don't focus on hard taxonomy. They focus on, yes, there's a light taxonomy, but focusing on key terms that are repeating. And what we're looking at is the patterning of reports that are coming out, and then you cross-reference it with temporal imagery, so multiple times of imagery, and look for patterning. Through that approach, our evidence has already been used in a, according to a leak, uh, leaked ICC investigative document, um, in an investigation of the defense minister of Sudan. In the case of the alleged mass graves, we were able to involve the, through the grid methodology from Card and Baker, we were able to involve the eyewitness um, in the actual imagery analysis. So how that happens is a old image goes to the ground with an alphanumeric grid map. So it can be used by people who are illiterate. And when it goes to the ground, they point to the alphanumeric square in grid that is where they allegedly saw an act. And this is an old image with no recent potential evidence in it. There's a vector heading on it, and what Isaac came up with is putting one landmark. And what we found in using it in Kadugli, Sudan, is that um, local people, when you give them an image and orientation, despite some people saying that folks in these environments can't understand satellite imagery, they are fish to water. They get it almost immediately. It's miraculous. And so the thing here is that now we're collecting granular information that helps us to orient the image within the spatial environment of the affected population. And then they never see our evidence. Okay, unless we publish it, we don't show them whether or not it's corroborated because you never want to lead the witness. And often through our methods, we're leading witnesses. So you want to separate the, when you, it's about postures. I'm going to stop talking after one point. <laughs> it is about postures. 
When you go in, you have to declare your posture. And if your posture changes, you have to declare it. So if you're going in to provide information for disaster responders, you gotta put your hand up and say, we are in a information provision posture for humanitarian assistance. If your job is to try to collect evidence of an alleged crime, you, you have to basically say what posture you're in because that, that is a clear consent issue for people who are interacting with you. If you come in in humanitarian clothes but your real goal all along was to develop a war crimes case, that, that is, would be an issue in ground response as well. So it's, when you get to the posture, you build your methods to the posture. In the case of SSP and the pilot phase and what we've been doing at Signal, I, I think we have found ways to take digital and non-digital data with a remote sensor and be able to cross corroborate. I think we have time for two more questions. So let's do one and then two. So right there. Um, really interested in, in how you know, people that you're trying to reach can communicate um, even if they don't, aren't, you know, don't necessarily have high literacy and everything you discussed. But we also talk about people contributing data when they are going, when they can see that, um, when they can also get something back from it and feel like they're part of something. So for instance, say in like the case of civic engagement where people um, maybe want to call in and um, start discussions about something, report things they've seen when people are reading it and able to see comments, you know, we see that the crowd starts to really comment on the comments and certain things get, um, you know, filtered out, oh, that's, you know, that's BS or that's not, or yes, I witnessed that too. How can you or anyone like envision that sort of interaction being possible via voice? I mean, face-to-face -face communication is really how that happens in, uh, I'm imagining, in an illiterate community. It's the old-fashioned way. But how would that translate, you know, you put your, your, your voice on it, goes to Facebook, YouTube, wherever, do you never see it again? Or just have you thought about those, those ideas? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Thanks for that. So, I mean, sure, there are so many challenges with voice. It's not that there are not many challenges. And one of the challenges is that how do you search voice? Because if you think about speech recognition, speech recognition works for English, maybe Spanish, maybe French. But if you talk about Hindi, which is one of the, one of the biggest languages spoken in India, and uh, have, of course, almost uh, close to 800 million speakers, the speech recognition efficiency is 50% or maybe 60% at tops. But when you talk about other languages, the speech recognition is bad. Sure, speech recognition is a problem. But the way we think is that you would need either a fleet of call center to transcribe and translate the content so that it is searchable. That's one option. The second option is that you can use crowd to do a lot of these tasks. For transcription and translation, you might use mTurk. But then there are several other tasks like what should be what should be live, what, what data should be published and what data should not be published. Well, my question is really, even if it were, let's say you had perfect speech recognition or free transcription, the people who are illiterate aren't going to be able to absorb and see and read that discussion and participate and have the back and forth because they're not reading it. Right, uh, right, right. So we are building some, I mean, uh, so we are, so, so your question is how a uh, illiterate person is going to listen what, to what a person on web is saying? How do I engage, is, this, is it still, unfortunately, because it's a challenging, it's a very challenging problem, right? It's a one-way channel, in a sense. Like, you encourage people to commu you know, contribute, and, but yet they don't get the, the gratification that people get from contributing in a forum where they can search it and browse it and, uh, you know, explore it freely because it's sure. linear and... Sure. So, what we are working on right now is how we can have, I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question correctly or not, but you can, of course, tell me. But what we are working on right now is how can, how can we have a bi-directional communication between internet users and phone-based users. So a person who is in a rural village is recording some stuff using a basic phone and 2G network. And maybe if you want to respond to him for, for anything, then you would be using your Facebook account or maybe using your YouTube channel and using your devices. So we are definitely thinking in this direction, and we are building a device agnostic and network agnostic way in which you, what you are saying, using your network and using your platform, reaches out to the people. Mm -hmm. And 
There are problems with searching and indexing, but the way is that I am communicating to you with my voice, with an audio message, and you communicate back to me with your voice and with your audio message, rather than by typing from your keyboard. So hopefully in six to seven months from now, we would release the second version of IVR Junction, which would have this capability that anyone, which is more or less like voice internet, that irrespective of the network, irrespective of your location, irrespective of the device, irrespective of the social media platform you are using, you will be able to access and contribute knowledge. And everyone would be accessing the same stuff. I'll be happy to chat online uh, later.